Welcome to the Bob Full Report. Today, I want to discuss about uh, President Xi Jinping's perceived third term and what his agenda and uh, what has been impacted over his first two terms and what can we foresee his third, maybe fourth, and according to many China observers, President Xi is seeking to be the president for life, like uh, the brutal dictator uh, Chairman Mao Zedong. And he has successfully removed the presidential term limits by changing China's constitution in his uh, second term. And now in October, in late October, the Communist Party is reconvening for the party's 20th Congress. So this is the time President Xi Jinping is uh, definitely going to be so-called re-elected to his third term. Because during the past senior leader, a strong military man, Deng Xiaoping's time, after Chairman Mao, there has been agreement among the party's senior leaders, uh, rank and file, that the party's boss, which means the party's secretary uh, general, uh, usually only um, like uh, take the reign for two terms, no more than two terms. But President Xi Jinping, already known as Emperor Xi, uh, for his uh, brutality and his, de his desire to be the ruler of China forever, and has already um, took, uh, taken all the necessary steps to make sure he will get the third, fourth, and maybe fifth terms. So what's in his uh, agenda and what uh, had happened during his first 10 years as a party secretary and president in China? We have seen um, Communist Party leader uh, had uh, President Xi Jinping has uh, declared at least uh, three wars in China's society after he took over. So the first war we have seen he declared is the war against the cross. A cross, basically a wooden cross on the rooftop of the church building. Some were made by the iron metals and the, the President Xi Jinping with his uh, lieutenant um, in Zhejiang province, where he used to be the, uh, both the governor and party secretary, uh, from 2012 had uh, basically declared the cross on the rooftop of the church building is a national security threat. Is a threat to the existence of the Communist Party. So his lieutenant, uh, Mr. Xia Baolong, who was the party secretary of Zhejiang province, uh, launched a, a cross demolition campaign in the whole province. So within a, really that year and the following couple years, thousands of crosses were forcefully demolished and burned, destroyed, and totally, some churches were totally even destructed. I mean, basically, uh, from that prime province alone, and many pastors, uh, these are government-sanctioned pastors, government-sanctioned church pastors, or even leaders of the three self-patriotic movement from that province were arrested, were even convicted under all kinds of uh, uh, manufactured 
terms such as uh, illegal business or even corruption. And uh, some were sentenced to 12 years or 14 years imprisonment for refuse to voluntarily demolish or take down the cross from the top rooftop of their church building. And then President Xi Jinping extended this uh, forced cross demolition campaign to other provinces all over China, in Henan province, Hebei province, Shandong province, and uh, Fujian province, and the Inner Mongolia province. So many had been carrying out. So we have, I mean, stunned, I mean, the whole world, like all of a sudden sees the Communist Party launched this campaign, basically making the cross as the enemy of the state. So we have found like hundreds of uh, military police with government hired workers driving bulldozers and this launch, I mean launching a march toward the church and uh, basically threaten the church leaders said if you don't take down your church cross, we will do it forcefully. And they did it. So that is the first war since really the Cultural Revolution, the Communist Party declared against the cross. I mean, we all know from the scripture, as Paul said, I mean, who would regard the cross as the enemy? The cross, a symbol of a peaceful, many even like the Red Cross, they use the cross as a peaceful symbol for uh, uh, charity. And uh, for Christian faith, you know, that the cross symbolize the central message of our salvation in Jesus Christ who was crucified on that cross for our sins and for the uh, substitute of uh, uh, sinners and um, those who believe what he has accomplished with the Holy Spirit will be saved. So for Paul, he announced that for those who are condemned, those who are facing the eternal separation with the light, with the salvation of Jesus Christ, they would treat cross as the ultimate enemy, the fatal destiny for them. So the Communist Party basically treat the cross as the enemy of the state. That's the first war. The second war is uh, the war against God's servants, especially the war against Christian children. I mean, Communist Party, including, of course, their propaganda department and uh, all other branches, issued orders said nobody under 18 years old, no students, no teachers, no even uh, nurses, doctors, certainly no Communist Party member, no Communist Youth League members. These are all forbidden people to even come to the church building. So all of a sudden, millions of Chinese Christian children were mandated to sign a form prepared by the Communist Party to renounce their faith in public with their parents, teachers, their principals, and even with the, the Communist Party Public Security Bureau members on the stage. So this is a, a major war against the God's children because the Communist Party believe if they can control the children, control the youth, control the students, they will control 
the future of China. The third war is the, the war against the rule of law. As we all know, since 2015, the Communist Party, all of a, basically without any warning, pre-warning, all of a sudden from July the 9th, 2015, to be exact, a few hundred of Chinese human rights lawyers, human rights defenders, legal activists were all rounded up. They were, like some were very international, well-known human rights lawyers, such as uh, Wang Yu and her husband, Bao Longjun, such as uh, lawyer Li Heping and his brother Li Chunfu, and uh, such as uh, Beijing a long-time democracy activist and a house church elder. And many were all rounded up, arrested, and later on, we all learned they were all tortured, being forced to be at a torture chamber in a dark room, in, and, and in, a, in a tiger chair, being, being chained like an animal with their hands and feet being shackled and chained. So this has been going on for quite a few years. And um, all the, there is no um, uh, fair uh, or even like a basic uh, dual process because they were kidnapped and they were disappeared. And their and lawyer Wang Chuanzhang for like three, four years. And another lawyer, uh, a Christian lawyer, Gao Zhisheng. And this year, this October, I mean, mar marked for the fifth year of his enforced disappearance. No word, dead or alive. Nobody knew where he is being held or what his condition is. No family members had been contacted or, you know, being made aware where he is. And already, two of his family members committed suicide out of desperation and oppression against them because of a dis, I mean, in disappear, in forced disappearance, a uh, Chinese human rights lawyer. So that is a major setback for the rule of law in China. Many Christian lawyers that uh, have worked with China Aid over the years for helping basically uh, build up a, a civil society for China by training the house church leaders to respect the law, to follow the rule of law, the spirit of rule of law, and to teach even the judges, the prosecutors, the public security, uh, bureau members, and all of a sudden, they have become the group of uh, the enemy of the state, rounded up several hundred, yeah, and they were all tortured or under enforced disappearance. So the war against the cross, the war against the God's people, so many pastors were arrested for preaching a sermon based on John 3.16, like a pastor Wang Yi, who was uh, arrested on a Sunday, like uh, almost last week of uh, uh, the December 2018, um, based on John 3.16. He was just uh, uh, calling for President Xi Jinping to stop his repressive policy, to repent what he's doing, and uh, to accept Christ Jesus as his Savior and Lord. That's called subversion of state power, nine years imprisonment he received on Christmas Day in 2020 during the COVID. And then his wife, his uh, uh, son, uh, Joshua, they were all arrested. His son was uh, nine years old when he was arrested. And he was being forced to take a police car, cut off 
from his、uh, Christian education, and basically every day has to take a, a ride with the police. I mean, in a police car to go to a Communist Party brainwash school, indoctrinated, two years without seeing his mother, Sister Jiang Rong, who was put under house arrest, not under her house, but in an undisclosed location, under torture. Nobody knew where he she was being held during that two years. Until her husband received the nine years imprisonment after secret trial, then we have seen under the banner of sanitization of Christianity, like make Christianity compatible with socialism and communism ideology. Many other pastors were also arrested. Some were arrested and sentenced for eight years, ten years. For simply being found in possession of、uh, the so-called evil cult books, such as *Pilgrim's Progress*, such as *The Streams in the Desert*, such as John Calvin's *Institute of、uh, for Christian uh, uh, Institute of、uh, Christianity*. So that is,、uh, these are all deemed in the Chinese court paper. As evidence of evil cult, eight years, ten years, we have seen other pastors from Early Rain Covenant Church, Pastor Wang Yi, like Pastor Wang, Pastor、uh, my good friend, Pastor Zhang Tao, seven years imprisonment for setting up sixteen schools for two thousand children, not even in the China border. It is in outside China border in Burma. Or also known as Myanmar, yes, seven years imprisonment, and we have seen in now in recent weeks there are actually more arrests because Chinese government passed more regulations banning the Chinese Christians from traveling to overseas to even attend a Christian conference, a Bible seminar. Already five. Were arrested after they were found traveling to Malaysia legally at the time and、uh, attending a summer, basically a camp on the Bible study groups in Malaysia. Back to 2017 or 18, and now this new law retroactively haunted them. And we have seen, you know, all the Bible apps were being forced to be removed from Apple Books, Apple Store, and Apple actively complied, corroborated with the Communist Party by totally complying. So the Chinese, 1.4 billion people, do not have a Bible app to download from their Apple phone because there is none. No Bible-related apps, and all e-commerce stores were forced to remove the sale of Bibles. So the Communist Party basically tried to deny the literature, the access to the Bible of Christian faith. So it's very dark. It's very cloudy spiritually under Xi Jinping, and we can anticipate. In the next ten years, under his leadership, there will be more restrictions. I mean, I think China is marching into the North Korea new cultural revolution、uh, time, maybe even worse than Chairman Mao's time. And now, should we be concerned? Yes, we should. And、uh, the Bible tells us. Remember those who are in bond, as if we are bonded with them. Like we are taught, told to remember those prisoners of faith, as if we are fellow prisoners. So we should remember them. At the same time, should we be discouraged? Should we be disillusioned? No, I think、um, 
this is expected. In essence, from the time of early churches, remember the first persecution in Jerusalem, and then to Judea, then to other Asian areas where the gospel are being spread. It the persecution, discrimination are the norms for Christian faith. Then we have seen from year three, uh, from basically AD AD sixty four, from the time of uh, Nero to the Roman Empire. Uh, Diocletian in the uh, two th uh, three thousand. I mean, uh, in the AD three uh, twelve or oh, twelve to thirteen. So over two hundred fifty years, all these emperors, Roman emperors, yeah, from Nero to Diocletian, had been persecuting Christian faith. Sometimes like ten years. Uh, greatest persecution under Diocletian, Christians were being ordered to be uh, executed. And uh, we all then learn after that, there is a little peace in Roman Empire, and then in other parts of the world, in the, uh, the Christians had been consistently being persecuted until, of course, we know in modern days, we know the 20th century, there are more martyrs for Christian faith than the previous 19 centuries combined. From the Stalin, of course, under Soviet Union, to this uh, uh, radical um, Islam-like countries in Saudi Arabia, to Iran, to Pakistan, persecution of against Christians there are norms. And that's why I think Paul said, anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus shall be persecuted. And Americans, you are part of the anyone. The Britons, the Europeans, the so-called free Western society, we are part of the anyone. If we want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, we should anticipate persecution. I think now after three years COVID dictatorship, at least many little mayors, governors, or president, or uh, the uh, premiers through the COVID dictatorship against the church, especially in Canada, in the US, in Europe as well. Yeah, the persecution I believe at least active discrimination has already come to our door and I think passive persecution is very, very now actively uh, considered inside the Western society just simply because of your Christian faith, because you want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, not only in private but public, not only in your church, in your home, but in your workplace, in your public square, if you dare to demonstrate or pronounce your faith principles and on the cultural issues, then yes, if you touch this political correctness taboos like woke culture, like LGBT issue, like uh, the life, uh, so-called you know pro-life, pro-choice issue, if you're a Christian, and you make your stand clear, then it will impact your career, your life, your daily routine, and your public life especially. So brothers and sisters, maybe the lessons that our persecuted brothers and sisters in China have learned can be a good, um, some step-by-step uh, -step lessons. So we can talk about that later on in the future. But let our hearts not be uh, disheartened. I um, uh, want to really um, encourage you uh, to pray fervently and um, uh, walk justly and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. 
Thank you. And God bless you. Thank you, Bob, for that report. As always, Bob uh, brings us just such a unique perspective, um, just this holistic perspective to everything that's going on in China. And while the future of China uh, and religious freedom may look bleak, um, we cannot give up hope, as Bob said, and remember our brothers and sisters who are suffering in China for their faith. There's not necessarily ultimate demise for China, though. This is just in, uh, recently, there was a very active protest in Beijing. Um, now, this isn't like some of the other protests that we've seen over the last year over zero COVID policies. Uh, those, po those protests were more students and they were gathering on campus with signs. Um, some of them had a thousand students or so and they were effective. Uh, those students, if you remember at the time, were protesting because they wanted to go home, they wanted to uh, be able to leave their dorms, go somewhere else, um, and the other administrators of their school had kind of arbitrarily decided that they, um, the administrators and the faculty could walk around campus, but the students could not. So the students protested that. It's not like that protest. There's not picket signs. There's not any of that. But this was a very clear demonstration, I believe, of the uh, Chinese spirit um, for many Chinese citizens uh, right now. So this, this uh, protest happened in Beijing. Um, as you can see on your screen here, it was a overpass, a bridge overpass, where somebody had hung these uh, messages along the railing, as you can see there in Chinese. Some of these messages are uh, reporting, you know, sentiments uh, against the Communist Party, you know, wanting to overthrow the Communist Party. But one of the, the main uh, lines of uh, the protest is to get rid of the zero COVID policy, get rid of Xi Jinping, and start social reform, political reform. So as we look at everything that's going on in China and how bleak it looks, we have to remember that there's always hope um, and that the people in China are not giving up, so we shouldn't either. Um, now, I do want to say real quick about this protest. It's very, very effective. One of our Chinese editors here for the Chinese website noted that this may be one of the most influential, maybe not influential, most uh, potent protest demonstrations in the last 10 years. Uh, apparently, according to some sources, this has been planned for quite a while, um, and it, it's very apparent. Um, this is a, an overpass bridge, as I said, but it's actually a very prominent one in China. Um, our Chinese editor was actually familiar with where this was. Um, he also said that, uh, as you can see in this photo, there's this thin line of smoke coming up. Uh, and that was intentional. This was set up by the demonstrator um, trying to draw attention to this bridge, this very central location bridge, trying to get people to come to it and see this sign personally. Now, this bridge is 150 meters wide. So it's a very prominent area. Um, it's, it's got a lot of space for a message and the smoke is attracting people to the message. And so this, this is great stuff. This is really good for anybody who is a fan of freedom in human rights in China. The citizens know um, that Xi Jinping is a tyrant. And uh, we just have to hope that one day they become empowered enough to do something about it. Or that the government realizes this and replaces Xi Jinping and his power. But really, the best thing that you and I can do is to pray for our Chinese brothers and sisters, for those who live in China, and ultimately for Xi Jinping himself. Pray that he finds salvation. And pray that he, despite all of the evil that he's done, that he's able to repent from his ways um, and find a relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, if we don't hope that for our enemies, then there's no hope for us, right? Anyway, thank you so much for joining us on the Bob Fu Report, and we look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.